Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fih, mubarakan alayhi kama yuhibbu rabbuna wa yirda. Jalla jalaluhu wa amma nawaluh wa sallillahumma wa sallama wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Alhamdulillah, we can, we're, we're, we're done with the days of Ramadan where we're tired, we've gone through that whole cycle, and Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with going through that month, right? And today in my khutbah, I talked about the continuation of our spiritual journey, right? We talked about all the good deeds that we did in Ramadan, we talked about the salah, the fasting, the increased ibadah, the du'as, the adhkar, we did everything extremely extra in Ramadan. And that's one of the blessings of the month of Ramadan, that we were able to go even further than what we normally think that we'd be capable of. So we go above and beyond in the month of Ramadan and inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from us. And we find ourselves thinking about how do we continue that, that train, right? This, this, this feeling of spirituality, coming to the masjid, being around others who are also thinking the same, remembering Allah, praying. It's something that is easy to do in Ramadan because everyone else is doing it. Right? Everyone around us is doing it. When we come to the masjid, everyone's doing it. You don't need to, uh, to, to go out to pray. Like the adhan is going to be called. Right? You have, everything is there for you. So when you're around that environment, it's much easier for you to do. But outside of Ramadan, it's a little bit more difficult. Case in point, mashallah, when I did this talk right before Ramadan, this masjid was full. And now we have just a few handful of people, alhamdulillah. But it's a little bit more difficult and challenging after Ramadan. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, how, how can we continue after Ramadan? And in the khutbah I mentioned, I'll, I'll summarize a few points, inshallah, that build off of the continuation of this talk. But I mentioned how the purpose of Ramadan was for us to taste the sweetness of ibadah. That when we would stand in the night and when we would pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not something that we do every day. That's not something we do every night. It's something that we did in Ramadan. We would stand and listen to amazing recitations by the Imam. And we would stand in Qiyam in the middle of the night. And we would stand and we would make dua and we would cry and we would feel so emotional and so spiritual. And this, this showed us, it gave us like a sample, a reminder that the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really a beautiful thing. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the remembrance of Allah, the worship that we do when we remember Allah, this provides our hearts with peace, tranquility, this is what Allah means. Every Ramadan, everyone says it. That this Ramadan, it feels so good. It feels so good when Ramadan comes, especially the last 10 nights when we're in the masjid, we're praying, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It always feels great. So the purpose of Ramadan is to remind us about how wonderful worshiping Allah is and how it's not a daunting thing. The worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be something that we look at and that we, that we feel is difficult to do or it's a bother. It's getting in the way. Like I have exams, ah, I have to pray. It shouldn't be that way. And so Ramadan shows us that this worship that we do can be very beautiful and very enjoyable as well. So that's the purpose of Ramadan. And because of that, it recharges us. And I mentioned in my khutbah too that every year, subhanAllah, every year when you work a corporate job, they give you an annual bonus. It could be 5%, 10%, whatever. But this bonus is not because the company loves you. <laughs> it's not because they don't want to get rid of us, right? We're numbers. Tomorrow we can be fired and the next day someone will replace us and they won't even blink. We'll just be another, another person that went through that system. So they give us bonuses not because they love or care about us. They give us bonuses because it motivates us to keep working, to work hard, right? If we enjoy our jobs, if we like our company, then we're going to be willing to do more work for our company. So this is what what we do in the real world, and in, in, in a very simple way, Ramadan also recharges us and remotivates us for the rest of the year as well. So this is the purpose of Ramadan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises those people who continue to do righteous deeds. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. Ramadan is wonderful. 30 days of worshipping Allah, of praying to Allah, of asking from Allah, of reading Quran, abstaining from that which we should abstain from. 
But what do we do after 30 days? How do we continue and keep going after 30 days? The Prophet ﷺ, he mentions in a hadith, I mentioned this in my, in my khutbah as well, but we'll expand upon it a little here. The Prophet ﷺ mentions in, in a hadith, he says, Saddidu wa qaribu. He says, Saddidu wa qaribu. Close any gaps, right? Cover up any faults that you may have. Close any gaps and come close. Wa qaribu. And this is, like I said, poetic language that the Prophet ﷺ was talking about you and you're striving towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, striving towards your goal. Saddidu wa qaribu. Cover up any gaps and get close. Aim for the goal of the pleasure of Allah and Jannah and just do your best to get there. And the Prophet ﷺ mentions, he says, know that none of you will ever attain Jannah simply by doing your good deeds, just by your actions alone. And then he وسلم, says, so he says that verily the most beloved deed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that which you do consistently even if it's a small thing. And Imam al-Nawawi rahimahumullah he talks about this, about this genre of hadith. This idea that if you do a small thing but you do it consistently, Allah loves this even more than a grand gesture. And he mentions about this, Imam al-Nawawi says, rahimahumullah, he says that the little that you do is better it's better because it's better than the grand thing that you do if you do it for only a short amount of time. The little that you do that's consistent over a long period of time, it's better because every time you're engaging in that thing that you're doing, you're engaging in the obedience of Allah. You're constantly in the obedience of Allah. And every time you engage in that thing that you're doing, you are constantly remembering Allah. And every time you engage in that thing that you're doing, you are constantly refreshing your intention and your ikhlas, your sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is true. If we just think about a, a seemingly insignificant deed, something that's very small, an action that we might think is very little, right? You might have the intention that every time you come to the masjid, maybe this is a good one, right? A small one. Every time you come to the masjid, you won't leave the masjid until you pick up some garbage or you clean the masjid in some way. That could be your thing. Ya Allah, this is my goal. This is the ibadah that I'm going to do. I'm constantly going to be in a state where when I come to the masjid, I'm taking care of your masjid. I'm cleaning your masjid. And so Imam al says, this little thing that you're doing, every time you do it, you're in obedience to Allah. And when you do it, you're going to remember, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I want to obey Allah. I want to worship Allah. And every time you do it, you're remembering that you're doing it for the sake of Allah. So you're refreshing your, in, in, your intention and your sincerity. So that little that you do that's consistent, it actually, he mentions, that it extends far beyond the great thing that you might be doing. So that grand gesture that you would do, I mentioned in my khutbah, right? 27th night, we want to give $100,000. Our heart yearns to give $100,000. But that $100,000, if we did that one time in our life and that was it, it would pale in comparison to just giving a dollar a day or a dollar a month. And it might be so, it might be so that however little we decide to give by the end of our lives, when we end our lives and we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the little that we did actually added up to be more than that grand gesture. It might actually add up to be more than that grand gesture. So this is why the, the consistency is so important. This is why doing the little things is so important. And I mentioned in my khutbah as well that being a Ramadan Muslim is not a good thing. Being someone who only worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan, it's actually something that the, the Salaf, they used to despise these people. That, and I don't say this to discourage anyone because that's not what I mean. It means the people who forget about Allah. That meaning outside of Ramadan, they don't care about Allah. Like Allah, it doesn't matter to me anymore. I'm just going to do whatever I want. These people, the Salaf, some of the, some of the great scholars of the past, they mentioned that what an evil group of people. Right? This is not a phenomenon that's new to us in America. This is something that's been going on for a long time. So the idea of being a Ramadan Muslim alone is a terrible thing to do. And so we should all have the intention to extend our motivation outside of Ramadan, just like it was inside, to continue our good deeds outside of Ramadan as well. And one of the, the stories that I mentioned was the story of a tabi by the name of Tawus ibn Kaysan. And this is beautiful because it talks, this story reminds us about the importance that our mindset is, how we should be motivated to continue to do good deeds. And 
for those of you that were in my khutbah, I apologize, it'll be a refresher, but maybe some of you weren't, so I'll mention the story. Tawus ibn Kaysan, rahimahullah, he was a tabi'i. So he never got the honor of seeing the Prophet wasallam. He was not a sahabi. And so he was a tabi'i, but he was known for constantly worshipping Allah. He was known for always praying in the night. And he would stand for a long time, and he would pray for a long time until his feet would get sore, he would get tired. And so Tawus ibn Kaysan, it's narrated that he once told himself, he was speaking to himself one time, he was praying at night and he got extremely tired. And his feet got tired. His feet started to get sore. And so he tapped on his feet, almost in a way to like console his foot. He tapped on his foot and he told his foot, he said to himself, he said, be patient and endure this, this difficulty. Endure this, this tiredness that you have. He's talking to his leg, right? And he tells his like, he says, be patient and endure. Do the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam think that they are going to overtake us? That they are going to precede us? Meaning, do the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam think that, that we're not going to compete with them in goodness, in deeds, in prayer, in ibadah, in worship? And he says, wallahi, we will compete with the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is a kind of mindset that we should have going into the rest of the year that we should be prepared to compete inshallah in every avenue and this leads me to my next point which is the way that the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu would prepare and be consistent throughout the rest of the year it all starts with the first point and the first point is making dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so how do we remain consistent outside of ramadan point number 1 the lesson the first lesson is that we make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allah accepts all of our deeds in ramadan this is the first step to remaining consistent. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted our deeds, a sign of the acceptance of our deeds is that we will continue those deeds. A sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted our ibadah is that ibadah will continue. Right? And so this is very, it's a big deal for a lot of us. If we found that we were doing really good things in Ramadan, and then we find that we're not doing those things outside of Ramadan, that's a moment for us to reflect. To think about, hey, hold on a second. Where, what, do I, what am I doing right and what am I doing wrong? Why is it that in Ramadan I was doing these things and outside of Ramadan I'm not? And of course, there's a level, right? There, there are certain ibadat that we do in Ramadan, we can't do them outside of Ramadan, right? There's the, the night prayers every single night. It's very difficult to do that outside of Ramadan. But it's the little things that we should be assessing. Right? It's the little things that we should be assessing. And it's one of those things, subhanAllah, that only you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know this. Nobody else can tell us that. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost to accept all of our ibadat so that we may continue those ibadat as well. And so the salaf, the sahaba, the tabi'een, the tabi'u tabi'een, for the next six months it's reported after Ramadan they would spend the next six months making dua, oh Allah accept our ibadah in Ramadan. Accept those prayers and those fasting and all the good deeds, good deeds that we did. And this is actually reflected also in the Quran. It's a motif that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expresses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example, he mentions in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When you see the conquest of Mecca, right? This is talking about the Prophet ﷺ when they conquered Mecca. You see the conquest of Mecca, right? إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ And you see the people entering into Islam in droves. Right? The message of Islam is now being accepted. And this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the effort that the Prophet ﷺ went through, the Sahaba went through, this effort is being accepted by Allah. Because now everyone is also accepting the religion of Islam. Right? You see people accepting Islam. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابٌ Immediately after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So glorify the praises of your Lord and ask Him for forgiveness. إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابٌ For He is the one who forgives. Immediately after, Allah is almost in a way praising the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Saying, you did your job, you did so well, now everyone is accepting Islam, what now? Celebrate, have a, you know, have a party. What does he say? He says, no, no, no. Now, now that you've done the deed, now you need to glorify me and you need to ask forgiveness for me. This is why when we pray our salah, every salah, after we say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, what do we say? The very first thing that we say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. 
Oh Allah, forgive me. Why? Because there may have been some deficiency in my prayer. I may have not had, you know, khushu concentration in that one portion of prayer. I may have been thinking about that sporting event or my work or my family. SubhanAllah, in the masjid, there's a kid that's crying, right? There may be something that is lacking in our ibadah, so we're asking Allah for forgiveness. So this is what the salaf, this is what the sahaba, the tabi'een, the tabi'een, tabi what they did to extend Ramadan outside of Ramadan. They asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept their ibadah, and they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them for their shortcomings and increase them in what they were continuing to do. And this is beautiful, my brothers and sisters. This mindset, asking Allah for forgiveness and constantly striving, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this in a very beautiful ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولِ وَمَن يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِم مِّنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? وَمَن يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger. And again, the language here is, is almost implying that this obedience is constant. You are in a constant state of obedience. It's not that you obeyed once or for a week or for a month. You're in a constant state of obedience. Allah says that whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger will be in the company. Will be in the company of those who Allah has favored. So a blessing, a virtue of being consistent, right, is that you will be, inshallah, in the company of those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored. Min al nabiyin wa siddiqeen wa shuhada wa salihin. From the group of people that includes the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs, and the good doers, the righteous, wa salihin. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa hasuna ula'ika rafiqa. What an honorable company. What a wonderful company to be a part of. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those people who are in this group of, of people with the Nabiin, the Siddiqeen, the Shuhada, and the Salihin. So my brothers and sisters, we find ourselves in the month of Shawwal. We went through Sha'ban, we went through Ramadan, we're in Shawwal, and we talked about how consistency is important. How we should remain consistent in our acts of worship. One of the ways that we can be pragmatic about this is in the month of Shawwal, the Prophet ﷺ reminds us to fast six days, right? Six days in Shawwal. So what a beautiful way to carry on the legacy of fasting than to fast in the next month. And to fast in the month after that and in the month after that. So the first pragmatic or practical tip that I can give inshallah to, in, to continue our legacy of Ramadan and inshallah it will mean that our Ramadan was accepted is to continue fasting. Fast in the month of Shawwal. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ ثُمَّ أَتْبَعَهُ سِتَّمْ مِنْ شَوَّال كَانَ كَصِيَامِ الدَّهَرِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that whoever fasts the month of Ramadan and then follows it by fasting six days in Shawwal, it is as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them the reward of fasting the entire year. The entire year. This is a huge blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole year of reward. So that's the first practical thing that we can do. Step, the, the second practical and pragmatic thing that we can do is to increase our salah, to increase our salah. If we were not consistent with our five daily prayers before Ramadan, then we should be consistent out after Ramadan. Or at the very least, we should do our best to be as good as we can with our five daily prayers. And Alhamdulillah, for those of us who do pray our five daily prayers, right? May Allah accept it from us. We should increase in the extra, the voluntary deeds. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us in a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says that an, an, an abd, a slave of Allah, will continue to do voluntary deeds and get closer to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love them through the voluntary deeds. So through the prayers, the extra prayers, the night prayers, the, the, the sunnah prayers, and the nawafil that we do, that a person will get closer and closer to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will love them through these extra prayers. So the first is to fast and the second is to pray. And these two go hand in hand. And regarding this prayer, this is actually, beautifully enough, it's an advice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet So we want to talk about advice, right? Everyone looks for advice. Oh my God. 
how can I make a million dollars? How can I, you know, advance my career? How can I do this? How can I, how can I have a happy life? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the most wonderful advice to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And it's advice that applies to each and every single one of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, He says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ He says, worship your Lord. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Until there comes to you certainty, yaqeen, conviction. And the yaqeen that's being spoken about here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to here is death. Right? Because death is considered that, that end all be all. It's where everything ends in this dunya. It's the, it's the thing that when we realize it, when we taste the death, that's when we realize everything was true. Right? That's when we see Jannah and Jahannam. We see the angels. We see the questioning that we go through in the grave. All of these things, now all of a sudden, it's no longer iman. It's no longer faith. It's now a reality. So Allah is telling us and telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi but by virtue, by extension telling us, وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Worship Allah constantly, consistently until you die. And this worship is that worship where we pray to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And Ibn Kathir Rahimahullah, he mentions about this particular ayah, right, regarding the, the nature, the consistent nature of this, because it's about your whole life. It's about your whole life. It's a lifestyle of worship, not a moment of worship. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he says, he says that the worship, meaning the prayer here, he says it's compulsory, it's wajib, it's compulsory on every single individual. As long as he or she is, has aql, is sane, right? Is there, is mentally present, this salah, this prayer, this ibadah, this worship of Allah becomes compulsory on this person. And he says, and you pray to your ability. Right? He says, you pray to your ability. However much you can, with whatever situation you have in your life, you pray. So if you have a condition, if you have health issues, whatever it is, you pray as much as you can. And he mentions the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu The hadith of, of Imran ibn Hussein, where he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says that pray standing. And if you can't pray standing, pray sitting. And if you can't pray sitting, then lay down and pray. And he mentions about this. He says that, that this is, this is a, a, a reminder of the the nature of ibadah, the consistent nature of ibadah, that Allah actually requires us. It's not an ask. It's not Allah is saying, if you want to, worship me often. If you would like, remember me outside of Ramadan. This is a commandment from Allah. So Ibn Kathir highlights the nature, the consistent demand to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this verse that was meant for advice to the Prophet Sallallahu and therefore advice to us as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many other places in the Qur'an, He describes this idea that, that subhanAllah, this idea of, of being consistently in a state of worship. And it's beautiful because anything can become worship. If you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that becomes an act of worship. If you about, are about to get into a car accident, right? And somehow you swerve out of the way and the car goes this way and the other car goes that way. And in that moment you say, Alhamdulillah, instead of the SH word, right? If you say that and you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that becomes an act of worship. So there are many acts of worship that we can do that are not just limited to being inside the masjid or physically praying. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the nature. He reminds us in, 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 of the tongue of many other prophets like Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. When Isa alayhi salam, he mentions when he's a young baby, when he's an infant, and he's speaking to Bani Israel. And he says, Qala inni Abdullah. He says, I am the messenger of Allah. And he continues and he says, Allah subhanahu wa has commanded me to be good to my mother and so on and so forth. And he has given me the book and whatnot. At the end he says, That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me. I'm a prophet. I'm a slave of Allah. I'm a prophet of Allah. And he says, and he has made me blessed wherever I go. And he has bid that I, he has made it so that I establish my prayers and I give zakat for as long as I'm alive. For as long as I'm alive, I'm going to be consistently doing these two things, praying and giving zakat. This is the kind of consistency that we see that's in the Quran, that's highlighted in the Quran, both commandments as well as the Anbiya alayhi salam speaking this from their own tongues. This is the attitude that they had. This was the attitude of Isa alayhi salam. He did not have the attitude that we do, that we worship Allah during a certain period of time and then we let it go.
So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us consistent and to keep us on the acts of worship that we did outside of, inside of Ramadan to outside of Ramadan as well. And I'm sorry if I, it sounds like I'm repeating myself, right? I keep talking about consistently and over and over again and doing it throughout the, the, the entirety of our lives and how it's important. But the reason why I keep doing it is because it really is important. The reason why I keep reiterating the issue of consistency is because the Prophet ﷺ talks about it. Allah talks about it. And there's many benefits to it as well. Of the benefits, of the benefits are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us a good life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us a good life now and also in Jannah. Right? I mentioned in, in my khutbah as well that the people, when they enter into Jannah, it will be said to them, eat and drink to your heart's desire. Eat and drink and be happy. Be happy because of what you used to do. You were always doing righteous deeds. So now you get to enjoy the fruit of your righteous deeds. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran as well. He says, Man amila salihan, whoever does good deeds, min dhakarin aw unfa, whether he be male or female. Wa huwa mu'minun. And he is a believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We will surely bless them with a good life. Allah says, We will give them, we will bless them with a comfortable, a happy, a good life. Hayatan tayyiba. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And we will certainly reward them for what they used to do, for the best deeds that they used to do. So this is something, subhanAllah, that, that transfers outside of just our religiosity and our spirituality. It will extend to the rest of our lives. That when we are consistent individuals, subhanAllah, we find that consistent individuals are more successful in every avenue of your life. In every other avenue of your life, consistency is key. There's a study that I came across as I was preparing my talk. There's a study about individuals who are consistent, who show characteristics of consistency. Meaning they are punctual, they're on time, they get things done, right? They're people who stick to their word. When they say they're going to do something, they do it. These are actually all things and attributes that Allah mentions in the Quran, right? In Surah Ma'araj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, hum li amanatihim wa ahdihim ra'un. hum bi shahadatihim qa'imun. People who are stiff, they're strong on their, on their promises. They commit to their words. People who are consistent are not just better Muslims, but they're better people. They're happier and they're more successful in, their, in the rest of their lives. So, if consistency is key, we talked about two things that we can do to extend the legacy of Ramadan outside of Ramadan. We said number one is dua, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds, asking Allah to forgive us, asking Allah to overlook our shortcomings. And number two, we said to increase in our salah, increase in our prayers. And number three, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahumullah, he mentions that during the month of Ramadan, he says that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, and the tabi'in, they would, they would do lots of good deeds, right? In Ramadan, we witnessed this. In Ramadan, we were doing everything. We were praying and sadaqah and dhikr and Quran and driving, listening to Quran. We were doing everything. Imam Shafi says that during the month of Ramadan, that the Sahaba would do all sorts of good deeds. And towards the end of Ramadan, they would do something very special. Towards the end of Ramadan, all of the Sahabis, they would all do the thing that they loved to do the most. The deed, the ibadah that actually resonated with them the most. So you'll find, if you look at the lives of the Sahaba, you'll find some Sahaba, they loved, they loved, they loved, they loved to give charity. That's what they just love to give charity. Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu ta'ala, he was a man who would give so much charity, his wife would get mad at him. He would always be in trouble because when he would get paid, he would, he would get a stipend from the government, he would give that to the poor and the needy. And he would go and borrow money from other people on a loan, he would take loans so that he could give that money to poor people as well. So that's something he loved to do. He loved to do that. Other Sahaba you'd find that they would love to recite Quran. So you'd find that they would spend the whole night reading Quran. Some Sahaba would love to pray. Some Sahaba would love to help others. They would be walking the streets of Medina looking for someone who's here that I can help. Who needs some help that I can help them with something. So they would all do whatever it was that resonated with them. So maybe if we, if we dig deep, maybe there's something that we can explore in our own selves. This point number three, maybe there's some deed, some amal, some act of worship that we love to do more than any other deed. And we should all make that intention, inshallah, myself included, that for the rest of the year, we're going to try to maximize that deed, to be consistent with that deed. Is that something that we can do, inshallah?
That's not a difficult thing, right? You already, we already love to do it. We just need to find out what it is. We need to find out what it is that we love to do and inshallah make a plan to do that as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who are consistent. So the Prophet sent him to give us some more, some more insight into this, this idea of how the Prophet sent him used to live. How would the Prophet sent him behave outside of Ramadan? Right? We know that the Prophet sent him, Aisha radiallahu anhu says, radiallahu anha, she used to say that when the month of Ramadan would come, the Prophet sent him would just, he would get serious. He'd get into this zone that nobody could distract him. Nobody could bother him. He was focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, focused on his worship. And especially during the last 10 nights, he would tighten up his waist belt and he would go very hard in the last 10 nights. But what would he do outside of Ramadan? Because now we're outside of Ramadan. Aisha radiallahu anha. And it's so beautiful because Aisha, the hadith of Aisha are very unique because they give us an insight into the Prophet's personal life. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she mentions, um, she says that the Prophet ﷺ, kinda, he used to pray the whole entire night or most of the night. Not the whole night, but most of the night. And he used to stand for so long until his feet would begin to swell. And he would do this all the time. Another Sahabi asked Aisha, one, someone from her family, I can't remember who, but someone asked her, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? Were there moments where the Prophet ﷺ instructed you to do things? Or were there moments where he increased in certain things? Aisha said, no. He was just consistent. He was consistently a good person, consistently an abid, a worshiper of Allah, consistently helping others. Like all of the things that he would do, all of his attributes and his characteristics, they were consistent. He wasn't a person, for example, like us, sometimes, you know, subhanAllah, we're doing great, and then sometimes we're not, right? Sometimes we find that we're, we're very careful with backbiting others, and sometimes we're so easy to backbite others. Sometimes we're on, and sometimes we're off. He wasn't like that, sallallahu alayhi wa But Aisha, she used to ask him when he would stand. And his feet would swell. And she used to ask him, Ya Rasulullah, why are you praying like this? Why are, you, why are you worshiping Allah in this type of extreme way? With this kind of consistency every single night? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not already forgive you for your past sins, for your previous mistakes, or anything that you could potentially make a mistake? You know, I, I, the answer of the Prophet ﷺ is so telling. It's so telling of the attitude of the Prophet ﷺ. And it's an attitude that we're lacking. It's an attitude that we're lacking. Here you have the Messenger of Allah, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, you are ma'asum, you are forgiven, you are pure. You will not make a mistake. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine control, His divine wisdom is behind you. So the Prophet sallallahu is doing this. He's worshipping like this and asking Allah for forgiveness like this. And when he's asked, why are you doing it? His answer is very reflective of his attitude. And his attitude, as he tells his, his wife, he says, Afala akuna abdan shakura. Should I not be a slave who is thankful to his master? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? A lot of times when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we feel accomplished. We feel like we just did something, like almost like we did a favor to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just prayed all of our prayers. It's good to feel accomplished, right? I'm not saying not to feel accomplished. But sometimes we give money to the masjid and we expect something in return. We expect something when we do good. We do good for someone else and we expect a thank you. We're not doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our attitude should be that we should be slaves, we should be servants of Allah who are grateful to Allah and who are consistently grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَفَلَا أَكُونَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا And Ibn Hajar, Hafid Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahimahullah, he mentions about this hadith, he comments on this hadith. He says, this hadith, it shows the way that the Messenger وسلم, used to strive in his worship, how he used to fear his Lord, and subhanAllah, how that striving was a consistent striving. It was a striving that was for a long time consistent. Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, he mentions the story of Fatima, and we all know this story. One time Fatima, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she used to get blisters. She used to get blisters all the time, not just once, but she used to get blisters on her hands from all of the cleaning and the, 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 the working in the home and doing whatever it is that she would do, she would get blisters on her hand. And she went to her father, the Prophet ﷺ. She'd go to her dad and she would say to her father, Oh my father, can you, dear father, can you please get like a slave or a servant or someone, you are Rasulullah, can you get us someone who can help with these chores? And she showed her, she showed him her hands and the blisters on her hands. He says, can you please get someone to help me with these chores? And the Prophet ﷺ, he told Fatima, he said, 
O my dear daughter, shall I tell you something that's even better than that? Even better than getting you a servant to help you? She said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, what is it? And the Prophet said, said, said every day, you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you say subhanallah 33 times, you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you say alhamdulillah 33 times, and you glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you say Allahu Akbar 34 times. If you do this, this is better for you than having a servant. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he narrates this. He says, this is the conversation that happened with my wife and her father. And then he was asked by some of the tabi'een, he was asked, oh Ali, did you ever let go of this practice? Did you ever find that you abandoned this practice? And he said, I never ever let go of this practice. From the moment I heard about this, for the rest of my life until now, he said, I have consistently been doing it. They asked him, he said, Ya, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, even on Safin, even on the day of Safin, which was this, this major battle, even on that day, he says, even on that day, I did not let it go. And so this is such a trivial thing we think. So saying subhanAllah 33 times, we can do it in three minutes. Three minutes of our day. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. Something so small. But it goes back to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that the action, the deed that's beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is that which is done consistently even if it is small. So, my brothers and sisters, we have to make ourselves consistent. We have to focus on being consistent. And we mentioned it's a conscious effort. And the last story, inshallah, hopefully the last story, yeah, inshallah, the last story I'll mention is the story of Bilal, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And, <clears throat> and this is a, a beautiful story of Bilal that should inspire all of us, inshallah. So we should leave feeling very inspired on how to be consistent on, and on the effort that requires to be consistent. Bilal, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was a slave pre-Islam, he was a slave pre-Islam. And he accepted Islam and he became a Muslim. And he became one of the mightiest companions of the Prophet ﷺ. One of the greatest Sahaba from all of the Sahaba. So Bilal anhu, one time, the Prophet ﷺ after Salat al-Fajr. So Salat al-Fajr, the Prophet ﷺ would lead the prayer and all the Sahaba would gather around him and some of them would tell him his, their dreams. They would ask the Prophet ﷺ to interpret what they saw, what it meant, so on and so forth. But one time after Salat al-Fajr, the Prophet ﷺ called Bilal. And he asked Bilal, he said, Oh Bilal, tell me the best deed that you, that you have done. What is the best thing that you have done after you have accepted Islam? And he says, because I heard your footsteps in paradise. When I went to the, to, to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Isra al-Miraj, I heard your footsteps, O Bilal. What an amazing, what an amazing feat. Right, for Bilal, what an honor for Bilal that your footsteps are heard in, in paradise near the, th near the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Bilal anhu, you can imagine it, the excitement that Bilal felt. Like, Ya Rasulullah, you heard my, my footsteps? Wow! So Bilal responds to the Prophet and he's thinking, he's racking his brain. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And he tells the Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, he says, I don't do anything that's worth mentioning. And, and the caveat here is, Bilal is a Sahabi. So when he's saying, I don't do anything that's worth mentioning, <clears throat> it means he's doing everything that everyone else does. He's praying his prayers, he's giving his zakat, he's, he's way better than what we're doing, right? So he's doing a lot. But for him, he thinks that he's not doing anything. He's like, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not really doing anything. And he says, I can't think of anything. There's nothing that I'm doing that's just exemplary. He says, the only thing, the only thing that I can think of is that anytime I make wudu, I just try to pray as much as I can. That's it. Every time I make wudu, I just try to pray. So if I have wudu and I'm, I'm going to pray a prayer and I make the jama'ah and then afterwards I'm just going to sit there and I have nothing better to do, I'm just going to pray. So I, he's saying that the, the thing that he does is a consistent act of worship that is essentially every time he has the opportunity to pray to Allah, to worship Allah, he worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Ya Rasulullah, that's the only thing that I have done. Every time I perform wudu during the day or the night, I pray after that wudu as much as what was written for me. Meaning until my wudu breaks again, I'm going to keep praying. And this is the mindset of Bilal anhu. The attitude of Bilal and this attitude of his, the consistency of his good deeds made him become someone who was, whose footsteps were heard in Jannah near the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who are consistent with our deeds even if they are little. My brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I'll end inshallah with this. 
I mentioned I'll give us some practical, pragmatic tips on how to be more consistent people. So point number one, if anyone, mashallah, has the, their phone out or wants to write this down or whatever, this is really good. So remember this, inshallah. Or maybe, mashallah, your guys' brains are so fresh, you'll just memorize them as we go. <clears throat> but here we go. I have, inshallah, six steps. And these six steps are derived from the Quran and Sunnah. And there is evidence from the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to support these six points. So if you want to be a consistent individual, and I ask Allah to make me and all of us a consistent person. If we want to be consistent, we have to do these six steps, inshaAllah. The first, the first step is to clarify our intentions with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and set our goals clearly. You, my brothers and sisters, I'll give you this example. You will not wake up tomorrow and be a hafiz of the Quran. I don't care how many nights you sleep. I don't care how many, like, how, how many dreams you have. When you wake up, you will not magically wake up one day and become a hafiz of the Quran. It, it will not happen. Just like you won't wake up and become a doctor. You won't wake up and become an engineer. You won't wake up and become a lawyer. The reason why that won't happen is because you have to make a conscious effort to become a hafil, to become a doctor, to become an engineer, to become a lawyer, it requires that you set out a goal. So the first point is to set your goals. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? We said today that we want to be consistent outside of Ramadan. That's a wonderful thing. But what does that mean? How are we going to be consistent? Am I going to increase prayers? Am I going to make ishraq every single day? Am I going to recite one juz of Quran every single day or once a week or once a month? Whatever it is that we want to do, Define it clearly inshallah. So make your intentions clear with Allah and define, have clear goals that you want to work on. That's number one. Be specific, be measurable, right? Be time bound, something that you can measure and be consistent with. The second thing, second point is learn how to prioritize. Learn how to prioritize. A lot of times we find ourselves in situations where we're juggling multiple things a day. There's work, there's family, there's you know, there's obviously our prayers, there's things that we want to do, our own entertainment, right? We just want to relax sometimes. So there's a lot of things that we deal with. Life isn't as, as binary, as simple, as straightforward as some of us would love for it to be. So sometimes life gets really complicated. We have to learn how to prioritize. And this is important. It's important because if we prioritize the right things, we will never miss those things. If we have family gatherings and things we want to do and so on and so forth, if we have a lot of different things going on, but we learn to prioritize our Quran, we learn to prioritize our salah, we won't miss our salah. If I prioritize that every day, inshallah, I make the niyam, the intention, the clear goal that I'm going to recite one juz of Quran a day, it doesn't matter what I have to do that day. I have work, I have school, I have family, whatever it is, I'm going to make sure whether it's in the morning, the afternoon or in the evening that I make time for that priority because it's so important to me. So that's number two is prioritize. Learn how to prioritize those goals. Number three, this is important as well. SubhanAllah. It's track your goals. Track them. So let's say you set out a goal until the next Ramadan, I want to learn X amount of Quran. So that's a wonderful goal, right? Or I want to pray X amount of prayers. It's a wonderful goal. Let's track this goal. So we have another 12 months, right? 11, 12 months until Ramadan. So let's track every single month. Month by month, let's keep our progress. Keep track of what we're doing and learn how to record that progress. This is going to help us improve and help us get better and help us stay consistent, inshallah. Number four, limit distractions. Limit distractions. SubhanAllah, you find that this is something that's common in, in, even in the workplace, right? At work, they tell you to limit your distractions. If you want to be productive at work, you have to put away the phone, right? Close out, you know, the, 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 in, the, the direct messages, right? Just focus on what you're doing. Be clear, intentional, and focus. So limit your distractions. If you know, and this is, SubhanAllah, this is the beauty. Islam is, is wonderful. It's, it's a way of life. If I know that my weakness is notifications, right? If I know that I'm constantly glued to my phone because the moment I get a text, I'm going to pick up my phone. Or the moment I get something from Instagram or something, I'm going to look at it right away. Or, you know, now I have this watch too, right? It buzzes on my wrist. I, there's no escape. If I know that this is a problem for me, it may not be a problem for you, but if I know it's a problem for me, I need to put these away. I have to overcome these challenges. I have to limit my distractions. So whatever that distraction is for you, it could be different than, than what's for me and what's for everyone else. But learn to limit those distractions. 
if it's family, if it's friends, if it's children, whatever it is, find a way to limit those distractions. Number five is track the time that you spend, right? And when I say track the time that you spend, I don't mean that you have to actually be sitting there with a clock and you say, okay, one hour I read Quran. That's not what I mean. What I mean is like in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu there are moments of the day where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prescribes a certain act of worship. So in the morning, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prescribes that you make athkar in the morning, right? Track that. Did I make that athkar in the morning? If that's your goal, did I do this in the morning? Track the time that you're spending. And when you record your progress, right? We mentioned step number three, right? For those who are writing, you remember, step three was record your progress. When you look at your progress and you find it's been three months, and I was supposed to memorize, you know, X amount of verses and I've memorized only two verses. You know, it's wonderful that I've tracked my progress, but if I don't remember or if I don't track how much time I'm actually spending, what good does that do for me, right? So I have to also be considerate of the time that I'm spending. Set aside some time intentionally and use that time to further these goals, whether it's building your relationship with Allah or whatever the goals that you have. So that's number five is track your time. And this number six is the last point. This is the last point, right? The last point is to be patient and to forgive your failures. Be patient and forgive your failures. Because it's going to get very difficult. It's going to be a very, very challenge, a very big challenge. We are battling with shaitan. And if Ramadan taught us anything, if, if we learned anything throughout the rest of the year, it's that these goals that we might set are incredibly challenging as well. So we have to make sure that we're patient we're trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're making dua to Allah that Allah makes us among those who can be consistent. And we're forgiving ourselves when we make a mistake. Right? And I call back to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Right? When the Prophet Sallallahu he mentions and, and he says, uh, he says, Saddidu wa qaribu. Right? He says, Over, overlook saddidu wa qaribu. Cover up those gaps, those deficiencies. The things that you missed, cover them, fix them, get past them. Wa qaribu. Track your goal, aim, and get close as you can to your goal. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbul Izzah, to make us among those who are consistent. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be better and more consistent Muslims. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be among those who take advantage of our time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of our good deeds in the month of Ramadan. To accept our fasting, to accept our prayers, to accept our recitation. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those people who witness the next year and the next Ramadan as well. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wa jazakumullahu khayra. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله